Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's briefing on the FEMA funeral uh, reimbursement program due to COVID. Uh, we have a lot of great speakers on here today. Uh, and we're going to start off with uh, Congressman Anthony Gonzalez, who's hosting this event. Uh, so with that, uh, welcome, everyone, and welcome, Congressman Gonzalez. Well, thank you, everybody, for, for being on, and, and good, good afternoon, and, and thanks for joining us today. Uh, look, this past year has been brutal on so many Americans uh, as the COVID-19 pandemic has changed our lives and the world as we know it. Uh, many of us here today, unfortunately, uh, probably know a friend or loved one who has passed away from this terrible virus. Uh, we're here today to talk about a wonderful program, though, uh, being led by FEMA to reimburse funeral costs for those who pass from COVID-19. I actually just for this, my mother called me and, and uh, was asking about this exact program uh, because we've had some, some friends, uh, certainly, who, who we've lost over the last year due to COVID. Um, but with that, I, I am pleased to introduce Kevin Sly, uh, FEMA Region 5 Administrator. Uh, Kevin is, uh, serves as the Acting Region 5 Administrator, serving in support of the region's six Great Lakes states and 34 federally recognized tribal nations. Uh, he previously served as the Director of Response Policy within the National Security Council Resilience Directorate. Uh, Mr. Sly enlisted in the U.S. Navy directly out of high school and switched to the Coast Guard in 1992 to complete his active duty career, uh, which we are immensely grateful for. Uh, like many other service members, he attended college part-time throughout his enlisted and commissioned career. Uh, Kevin earned a bachelor's degree from Exclusio College and a master's of business administration from North Central University. Uh, I'm incredibly appreciative of his 24 year military career and continued service to our nation. Uh, so Kevin's gonna walk you through how this program works. Uh, and uh, he also let me know that uh, he's got some kids graduating from college and high school coming up. So uh, we congratulate him and his family for, for a job well done and, and those exciting times. Uh, but Kevin, uh, thank you for, for all that you do and, and please take it away. Well, hey, on behalf of uh, FEMA Region 5 and FEMA writ large uh, as a whole, Deanne Criswell, the new administrator, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you and your constituents, uh, Congressman Gonzalez. And I'd also like to say uh, thank you to all of the folks there in Ohio that are on the call uh, trying to get this very, very valuable information to help some of your constituents uh, and family and friends out. So. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to brief your constituents, uh, which includes many of your district's uh, funeral directors who provide that critical service on this very new program. A as many of you know, the reason we are here today, uh, back in December of 2020, Congress passed and the president signed the Coronavirus Response and Relief Supplemental Appropriations Act of 2021 into law as a part of the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2021. This legislation directs FEMA to provide funeral assistance for those individuals and households with eligible funeral expenses as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. On April 12th, FEMA began implementing COVID-19 funeral assistance to reimburse individuals for funeral expenses for deaths attributed to COVID-19 that occurred after January 20th, 20, 2020. As expected, shortly after the program launched, the call center that we run, uh, which was set up to receive applications, has experienced a very high uh, call volume uh, since opening and totaling nearly over 100,000 applications just in one week. With that in mind, we ask for patients and encourage anyone calling in to submit their application to make sure they have their important documents ready when they call to apply. And in just a minute, I'll turn it over to Susan Jensen our Senior Individual Assistance Program Specialist. But before I do, I'd like to thank Congressman Gonzalez for his leadership on this issue and willingness to bring this call together to answer questions about this program. So looking forward to, uh, looking forward to Susan's brief out and I'd like to now turn it over to her to provide some more details on the, on the, on the program. So with that, Susan. Great, thank you so much. Acting Regional Administrator Sly and also Congressman Gonzalez for this opportunity. Um, as has been said already, um, this is a brand new program, a very, or, or at least a unique way for us to be administering this. Um, this pandemic has been going on for quite some time. 
And early on, many of us within FEMA, but also uh, within our voluntary agency partners and our state partners were concerned about the fact that so many people were being impacted by these really large and unexpected expenses, um, as well as, of course, the tragedy of losing family members to COVID. Um, these concerns were brought to FEMA headquarters. I know that there were many conversations between headquarters and the White House and also members of Congress about how this, this need could be addressed um, from a regional perspective, from a state perspective, um, our people were looking at ways within the community that people could be assisted. Unfortunately, this is not something for which there is a tremendous amount of money available. Some, some communities leveraged CARES Act funds for this, but again, it didn't cover a lot of people and certainly not all states chose to use the, their CARES Act money that way. So finally, um, next slide, Sarah. As Regional Administrator Sly mentioned, um, there were some very significant pieces of legislation that were passed. Um, the Coronavirus Response and Relief Act did allow for uh, the funeral assistance program to be administered starting with expenses that were incurred January 20th of 2020. That program, however, was only authorized through the end of 2020, so December 31st. We're exceptionally fortunate because of course the pandemic continues um, that the American Rescue Act was passed in March of this year and that extended the program through 2021. Now, there are other, other programs of which ONA is associated. And when there's a disaster declaration in a state for individual assistance, these programs become available. That has not been the case or had not been the case with other needs assistance. Every state has an individual assistance declaration for COVID, but up until this new legislation, only provisions were made for the crisis counseling program. And every state has one and they're working very hard with the families and those who have been impacted through joblessness or stress by the COVID pandemic. This legislation said that FEMA could use our program, the Other Needs Assistance Program to provide funeral assistance. Funeral assistance is something again, that's attached normally to a disaster declaration but we have never been able to pull the program out uh, of that IHP umbrella and offer it as a standalone program. So this is something that um, we see as tremendously beneficial to all of those families who desperately need this assistance. Next slide, Sarah. Again, the program started April 12th. And as uh, Mr. Sly said, there was tremendous interest in it early on. Um, there were many, many families who called, the whole times were long. That has been addressed now. And um, my understanding is of the call I was on yesterday, calls are answered within 22 seconds. So that is a, a significant um, it, it, a benefit and improvement, I should say. Now, while each state has a disaster declaration and in normal times we would be administering the other needs assistance program at a state by state level. This program is being implement, implemented at a national level. Consequently, um, the state cost share, which is normally 25% has been waived. This is a 100% federally funded program. What is different though, is that the decedent's place of death is tied to where the disaster declaration is. So if somebody passed in Ohio, that would be considered the disaster declaration that funds that assistance. Also, and this is um, you know, not without controversy because the individual assistance program is for individuals, uh, the payments go directly to the person who applies. Um, and so, 
that is a, a consistent piece of individual assistance and definitely a consistent piece of the funeral assistance program. Next slide, Sarah. So who is eligible to apply? Um, for primarily, of course, the applicants must be a US citizen, non-citizen national or qualified non-citizen. And they need to be the person who incurred the funeral expenses. And these again are expenses that occurred after January 20th of 2021. Now there are lots and lots of categories of qualified non-citizens and non-citizen nationals. Um, this applies to people who have um, green cards, people who are seeking asylum, refugees, or people that are in, in a special status in the United States. However, not everyone who's here legally is going to be able to apply. Um, temporary tourist visa holders cannot, foreign students, um, temporary work visa holders, they are not eligible for the program. Now, when people apply, we ask for their social security number and that is how we are verifying their identity. And this is an essential piece to make sure that we can actually um, verify who they are, that we can tie the assistance to somebody, and also that we don't duplicate assistance. Um, in, in this particular circumstance, there are many people who have contributed to each funeral in some cases. Um, perhaps if a mother passed, um, all of her children may have contributed. We can only accept an application from one person. Um, so we are taking it for granted that when they receive their reimbursement funds, if they're eligible, that they will um, share that with the other people that contributed. How it's very important though, that there is no requirement for the decedent to have been a US citizen, non-citizen national or qualified non-citizen. Um, all we need is to be able to verify the identity of the person who's applying. Um, and that is the critical piece. Also too, the death needed to have occurred in the United States. Um, but again, because the funds are tied to disaster declarations, um, people needed to have passed in one of the 50 states, the US territories or the District of Columbia. Also, the death needs to be attributed to COVID-19. That is certainly going to be a challenge um, in some situations where people passed early on in the pandemic. CDC guidance, um, for how the, the death certificates were, were supposed to be an, annotated um, came out, I think in April of 2021. And so there is concern that people will not have death certificates that say that the death was related to COVID. We'll, we'll talk about that a little, a little later when we talk about documentation. Also, funeral expenses cannot be covered by another source. Um, so if if someone has burial or funeral insurance, um, financial assistance that they've received from perhaps a, a government program, CARES Act money, things like that, or from voluntary agencies, um, some of which did actually have funds to assist people. Next slide. So what if the death certificate doesn't say was likely a result of COVID-19 or may have been caused by COVID? The, we are asking that the applicants go to the certifier of that death certificate and ask for it to be amended. Again, in cases where people passed early, um, there may not be that kind of documentation that others have later on. I did speak to one applicant whose death certificate or her father's death certificate did not say that he had passed from COVID but she had documentation from the doctor and the hospital that COVID was the underlying cause. That is sufficient documentation for us when that is submitted with a death certificate. We also need to see proof of funeral expenses. So that would be receipts, a funeral home contract, um, something that indicates 
the expenses that the applicant incurred. Also, the person who is applying needs to have their name somewhere on these documents, on, on the documentation from the funeral home. And then again, we talked about how this cannot be a duplication of benefits. So if insurance applies, that will be subtracted from their overall eligibility. I would never say to someone, don't apply because you have funeral or burial insurance or because they had prepaid funeral costs. I would absolutely encourage them to apply and let FEMA in our verification process sort through their eligibility. Um, I was thinking about a particular situation and I'm using big round numbers because I'm, I'm not a math person, but let's say that somebody's uh, funeral expenses were $20,000 um, and they had $11,000 covered by um, insurance. That still leaves that, that gap potentially eligible for federal assistance through this program. So we wanna make sure that, that people are told about the program, that they encourage are encouraged to apply whether or not they think that they're eligible. Um, and of course, the, the funeral directors who are on this call can, can really help and assist with that. It's a, a big piece of how we're going to get the word out to um, some of the people that would benefit most from this program. Next slide, Sarah. So the maximum amount uh, of the funeral assistance is $9,000 per decedent. That may not cover the entire funeral, but this is a, an, an amount that was arrived at by headquarters after doing extensive research um, with funeral homes and funeral directors across the country. Because it's not a state by state administered program, they had to arrive at what seemed an equitable amount for the entire country. Typically, if Ohio was declared um, for a disaster, a flood, a tornado, they would choose, the state would choose what their maximum amount would be for funerals. Um, we had to come up with something that wasn't state specific, which is again, why this is a nationally administered program. So again, one decedent per application. There can be multiple decedents, but we can only have one applicant for each person who passed. Um, for each funeral, the limit is $9,000, but there is a program maximum for the other needs assistance program of $35,500. So multiple decedents can go on one application, recognizing that the total expenses cannot pass $35,500 and that it's 9,000 or up to $9,000 per funeral. And again, not everyone may be eligible for that maximum $9,000 award for, for each funeral, but that is the maximum limit. Also two, the, the assistance is intended to assist with a variety of, of funeral costs for um, you know, burial, the services, interment, cremation. Um, it can pay for the transfer of remains, a casket or an urn, um, a burial plot or a cremation niche, park, it, the marker or headstone, also clergy or officiant services. Um, there's a wide variety of things, including people can ask for reimbursement for the cost of having their death certificates changed if that's necessary. Um, but again, with the proper verification, validation, and the process that we're going through at headquarters to uh, validate the documents, um, people should again not make themselves ineligible. Present this information and let FEMA make a determination as to whether or not the family is eligible for the assistance. Oh, I do wanna add though, that um, FEMA will pay for or can pay for uh, transportation for up to two people um, to come to the funeral and also the repatriation of remains. 
um, even though the death needed to have occurred in the United States, if they are from another country um, and the family wishes to have those remains repatriated, FEMA may be able to reimburse for that expense. So again, I think that's an important um, piece, especially since, again, we cover a wide variety of, of decedents and there's no citizenship requirement, et cetera, for them. Next slide, Sarah. Now, how do people actually apply for this assistance? Um, we have a toll-free number, which I've highlighted in yellow, um, and that is the one and only way. Normally with FEMA disaster assistance, we have an online portal that people can also register at. Because of the sensitivity of these registrations, um, the complexity potentially, and just as a customer service point, FEMA made the decision to have all registrations taken over the phone. Um, and so far, um, we have gotten very high, very high marks for the assistance that's being provided. This is a, you know, a program that's intended to be compassionate, that's intended to help families at their, you know, during their greatest need. And so um, that can best be done through a toll-free number. Also, um, when people register themselves online, um, they don't always do things correctly. They may mark something that prevents their, their application from moving forward. That becomes an extremely manual process for us and just delays people receiving the assistance for which they're eligible. So we're trying to make things as easy as possible. Also, the, the toll free number is open Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern time. Um, there is no end date to the program as of yet. Um, and so there's no need at this point to do weekend hours. This is not intended to be a stressful, time critical application. Um, people can call as they hear about the program, as they have time to call in and register. And again, this is retroactive to January 20th, 2020. And um, as far as we know, doesn't have an end date at this point. Um, how do people send their documentation in? Um, they can either be mailed or faxed, or they can be uploaded. And we do encourage people to sign up for a disasterassistance.gov account because then they have the opportunity to receive their correspondence electronically. It makes things much quicker and they can also check their eligibility. So that is um, something again, that this online account allows them to do. Um, if they wanna mail their, their documentation in, there's a mailing address as well as a fax number um, for people who um, have access to a fax and don't have other electronic capabilities. And I, I will say that when I was talking to some of the people that needed to apply for this program, there are people who do not have um, the ability to, or do not own a computer, don't have the technological uh, skills in order to apply online. And also surprisingly, um, several people said they didn't know anyone who, who did or could help them. Um, so this is something that, again, I think with the, with the funeral directors in particular, um, is something that maybe could help families um, get their paperwork turned in. Um, it would be a, a huge benefit, I think, in order to be able to help people access um, our program. Pending any questions, um, that concludes my presentation. But um, thank you for the opportunity. Back to you, Brian. Yep, uh, thank you. Actually, be, I'm gonna ask one question just as follow up and everything prior to uh, opening it up to Ben. And that was Holly had a question uh, in the chat. And oh, I lost it there for one second. Dun, dun, dun. Uh, her uh, father's death uh, has COVID-19 listed as one of the causes of his death. Is that acceptable if it's only one of the causes? Yes. Okay. 
the only requirement really from FEMA's perspective is that it says COVID on the death certificate, whether it's the direct cause or an underlying cause. Thank you. And uh, now uh, we're gonna, I'm actually going to hand it off to uh, Ben Easterling. Uh, ben has worked in the funeral industry uh, since 1973. He has worked as a licensed funeral director in Balmer since 1977 and owner of Swigert Easterling uh, Funeral Home from 1978 to 2020. Uh, ben is the past president and current board member of the Ohio Funeral Directors Association and the OFDA's current representative to the policy board of the National Funeral Directors Association as well. Uh, so Ben, welcome. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to make a few comments and then um, basically if there's a question or two, um, obviously funeral services is due to this uh, FEMA uh, application of funds as everybody else in the consumer range. Um, we've, we've been privy to uh, some information from our national association working with FEMA in, in terms of how to handle it or how not to handle it. Uh, I, I would think you know, if there are some funeral directors on this uh, meeting, uh, I know in our case, in many cases of funeral homes, I know we've already put a link to FEMA up on our websites, which gives both their protocols, their criteria, and the procedures for doing the application process, uh, keeping in mind that the funeral home itself is not an active participant in the application process other than an assistance. Uh, and that's the bottom line. Uh, pay payment of the bill is uh, irrelevant to the reimbursement uh, by FEMA. In other words, the funeral does not necessarily had to have been paid for, for the family to get the funds. And there right now is no bridge between uh, an assignment of those funds to the funeral home from the family or any assurance that the family is going to use those funds to reimburse the funeral home. So that if, if you want to look at a negative side, that, that from our perspective as funeral homeowners is sort of a major flaw at this point. That being said, uh, there's also discussion on pre-funding and the fact that um, you're basically penalized if you've done a pre-funded uh, funeral contract, sometimes quite often, well before the pandemic set in, uh, quite often uh, Medicaid had spin down driven and, and the fact that these funds um, cannot be reimbursed by the FEMA fund if, if a funeral service is actually executed. Uh, I'd like to point out the reference of, of funeral insurance uh, versus uh, life insurance or a typical life or whole life policy. I, I, those are exempt. I believe the people that use those funds, families are, are eligible to get the reimbursement but in, in funeral service, uh, where we have to put funds in a third party entity at the time of pre-arrangement, a lot of funeral homes use a, a insurance-based product. And, and that's specifically what they're talking about is the pre-need was funded through insurance, uh, second alternatives using a trust. So I know as recently as this weekend during a visitation, I had a, actually she was a lawyer, came in and was going to try to give some advice to the family. And uh, one, it turned out it was a pre-funded service, so the family wasn't eligible for the FEMA. And second of all, uh, she was confused about what the difference was between funeral insurance and a typical life insurance policy. And I tried to explain it to her, I hope accurately. Uh, if there are funeral directors on, uh, we've been advised by um, uh, Scott Gilligan, our council, both at the state and national level, that if you are asked to assist a family and want to provide uh, it as no cost, obviously that that's that's a typical function of most funeral homes. But if you're in a position that you uh, want to be reimbursed for your time, uh, you can be but you also have to have it on your GPL as uh, 
a miscellaneous item or miscellaneous post service of a fee. And usually it's done so much per hour. Um, I know most funeral directors were service related to begin with. So it's very difficult for us not to help families after the call. I, I've always told through the years to family that the service didn't stop at the time of the burial or the cremation, but that it actually, our service continued whatever they needed, whenever they needed following the death of, of a loved one. I'm not sure what else you wanna hear from our perspective. Uh, if I'm, if I'm politicking with the congressman, uh, it's too bad uh, funeral homes couldn't apply or at least be assigned the funds like we are in some insurance uh, in instances uh, so that we can guarantee our payment if you want the cold hard facts of it. Uh, fortunately, not many people go that route where they do not uh, pay their bill. But even though a receipt is uh, shown as one of the typical documents, uh, most families usually end up just getting an itemized statement, be it paid or not paid, to, to use as a point of view. I know a lot of funeral homes, and I, we're gonna get into this, are starting to review their um, families from the last uh, 12 to 14 months. And uh, in our case, we always keep a photocopy of the certified copy of the death certificate on file, and uh, we can review them and see which ones do have COVID and we'll contact those families if they have not already contacted us to let to point them at least in the right direction or give them any assistance they might require. It, um, like I said, it's, it's, it's new for us. Once again, for those on the, on the call that are of funeral service background, I uh, put a plug in for the state association. I pull up the website. Uh, Scott Gilligan has provided a almost 20 page a 20 question, question and answer uh, of the things that commonly you would run into in, in serving the families and trying to get them their FEMA reimbursement. Uh, I'm not sure if there's anything else you need me to say on this point or. Well, that's it. Uh, thank you, Ben. Uh, and you actually brought up a very good note. Uh, a lot of the funeral homes are going through their list of individuals that had COVID on the death certificate and providing that uh, information and that resource uh, because some people aren't getting out especially due to covid uh, individuals are not coming out into the community so uh, we have to reach out to them uh, through different avenues and one avenue is if they did uh, have a funeral at your facility and covid was on the death certificate uh, just reaching out to them uh, to provide the information that hey this resource is available uh, if you would call the number and apply for that and that number we did put in the chat along with uh, FEMA video, uh, the coronavirus economic funeral assistance information and the frequently asked questions. Those links are in the chat right now and we'll also get those out to people after this briefing. Uh, so with that, uh, I definitely wanna open this up. Uh, uh, well, first I'll open back up to Susan if she had any uh, further comments before we open it up on questions. Um, I would just like to add um, that I do think if a funeral home has the ability to do so, that reaching out to um, those families who have had COVID deaths is a is a excellent idea. And certainly if that family continues to have a debt to the funeral home, um, it's a good discussion to have. It's a way for them to get reimbursed for those costs. Um, but obviously, um, you know, this is a very busy time in your industry, and I understand that. And certainly not everyone will have the bandwidth to be able to do that kind of outreach. I also, if I could interject the point of very, very early in the pandemic, at least it was my experience, that uh, the use of the term COVID was not uh, uh, generally used early on on death certificates. In fact, there seemed to be a reluctance to put it put it on. In fact, early families we serve sort of be reluctant, almost in denial that uh, their loved one ha had the COVID. Uh, you mentioned going back to the uh, physician and you basically are getting a supplement to the death certificate done is, is, the, is the term within the state. Uh, and uh, it might take uh, some work with your funeral service uh, provider 
to coordinate with the physicians. Uh, getting the original death certificate sometimes a, a, a feed all on its own and to get a supplement to the death certificate provided by a doctor is uh, one step further. So I would encourage people that maybe are going that way that felt that the right ruling wasn't put on the original certificate should consult maybe first with the, the funeral home who maybe give them a, a, a better way to coordinate with the doctor's office. Yep, thank you, Ben. Uh, with that, uh, we'll open it up to any questions, uh, allow individuals to unmute themselves uh, and then ask any questions. Hello. Hey, Brian, I have a question. Yes, Melissa. So going back to if the death certificate did not already say that it was COVID related in the event there were other, you know, complications to the death, how do they contact, who are they contacting in order to get that amended? I missed that part. Um, FEMA is encouraging people to um, talk to the, the doctor or hospital that certified the death certificate. Um, but Ben may have additional information about that. Well, I, I actually just spoke on it sort of briefly. Uh, it's, it's somewhat uh, not a straightforward deal to get a death certificate signed in, in, in recent times. I, I would suggest that if a family is wanting to have their uh, loved one's death certificate, uh, a supplement done, and that's what it would take, uh, maybe contact the funeral home first. Uh, we all have history of the particular doctors we normally work with, and so, some have one particular way to approach, some have another way to approach. Now, I, I think it would be helpful to contact your fu funeral service provider first, and they could help coordinate with the doctor's office. Uh, because ultimately, uh, the, even though it's a, a state a department of health document, the, the funeral service is the one that's always been responsible for the completion of it. So I, I would contact the funeral home first if you want the truth of the matter. Okay. Thank you. And I apologize for the repeat on that. I had to take a work call while you were speaking. Well, I've been ignored before. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Thank you. Susan, uh, not to muddy the walls. I just have a question. So uh, for documentation, would a statement from uh, the position that it was due to uh, COVID or COVID complications, would a physician's, a certified physician's statement work or does it have to be uh, the death certificate? No, uh, documentation um, that says this in fact was COVID related um, will be reviewed at headquarters and at this point is seen as, as adequate documentation. So even if the desk is not amended, if the doctor provides a statement saying that it's mm -hmm. COVID certified yeah. statement. Thank you. That and might be easier than getting a supplement done. Yeah. In, in many cases, I agree with you. That's and again, you know, FEMA has tried um, on the one hand to uh, put verification processes in place because this is taxpayer money. On the other hand, though, we don't want the documentation uh, requirements to be so onerous that people are discouraged from applying and getting the assistance that they may need. So, um, you know, certainly there, if there's a better way or an easier way for somebody to get the documentation that they need. Um, I think that's fantastic. So thanks for that tip and bringing that up. I do have a question. This is Holly again. Um, my hey, question Holly. is, um, my dad passed away in January, height of all of the COVID um, infections, and my family spread out all over the country. So um, I do have receipts for the cremation and um, 
a few other things, his urn, but we have not met yet, nor had a funeral. Do you suggest that I, I wait to until we um, are all vaccinated and can get together to submit anything or to go ahead and submit now? Um, I don't know if there, how many funds have been allocated to the program and if they will run out or not. It's, it's really a personal choice for you and your family. Um, you can apply now and get reimbursed for the expenses that you have had, um, but then you can make an appeal to the program when you have your new receipts and the new expenses have been incurred. So you can do it either way. At this point, um, I think, I believe, and, and the Congressman can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, uh, there's $2 billion that's been appropriated now um, it's coming out of the disaster relief fund, uh, but there's there's no expectation that if um, we use the two billion dollars that there won't be more. Obviously, we can't promise that, um, and it's really up to Congress. But um, you know, this continues to be a great tragedy, and so I you know I believe that the government is is um, committed to supporting it. How would you go about doing an appeal? Um, you do an appeal um, in, this, in the same way, really, that you would submit documents. Um, you explain that, you know, the circumstances that you had your father cremated, but that the family wanted to wait to get together until it was safe, and that you have incurred additional expenses, and then attach those receipts and um, upload it or mail it to FEMA and they will, they will process it and review it. Now, I, I do wanna say, and I, I think this is important to, to note that this is not um, a speedy process. Unlike you know, a disaster declaration um, where we do a lot of auto determination for funds that go out for repair assistance or rental assistance, um, this is a manual process because there are many receipts that are turned in. Um, we validate things with the funeral homes in many cases. Um, and oftentimes too, there's additional documentation required. Um, they are already processing cases and there has been money going out, but um, you know, it can take several weeks or longer. Um, and so, you know, I do want to manage people's expectations. Certainly, um, you know, not hearing something right away other than the, the letter that FEMA sends that says, you know, we've received your application. Here's what you need to do. Um, it does not mean that things are not moving forward or that people are not eligible. Thank you, and uh, you're correct. And there's a uh, two million, a uh, two billion dollars advocated for this program right now. And so, uh, do we have any other further questions? Okay. Well, with that, I'm going to wrap up the program today's program. Uh, I will let everyone know that we will be sending out an email to everyone who's registered through Eventbrite. It'll have a link to this uh, recording uh, so that you can go back through and watch it again uh, to get any information, anything that you may have missed. Uh, and it'll give you an, actually, another opportunity to share that uh, with any individuals that you may feel uh, needs the information or on the reimbursement program or the other information provided today. Um, you are also welcome to, uh, if you feel, have any complications with the process, in our congressional office, uh, David Dobo is handling the inquiries. It is david.dobo at mail.house.gov. Uh, he is working them along with, uh, I believe, Brandon and Christina in the office. Uh, so feel free to email him as he's coordinating that program. Uh, and just on behalf of Congressman Anthony Gonzalez, we want to thank you uh, for participating in the event. Definitely uh, thank uh, Susan, Sarah, Mark. Um, I know Fred's on, uh, Kevin, uh, everyone from FEMA uh, for taking uh, part in this program, getting this information out to our constituents. Thank you again.